Hi, I'm Chao Wei Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and from the Frederick Health Hospital. Today, we're going to be talking about pericardiocentesis in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. The patient is a 65-year-old woman with a chronic severe pulmonary hypertension. Her uh, pulmonary artery pressures are 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury. She has had significant unexplained weight loss over the past several months and presented to the ER with um, worsening shortness of breath. Uh, she was uh, ill-appearing, uh, somewhat tachypnic, uh, but was normal tensive. Uh, she was 92% on 4 liters. Her neck veins uh, were up. The echo scene here uh, showed a uh, large uh, circumferential pericardial effusion. The uh, right ventricle was dilated. Uh, her uh, EF looked normal. So uh, you get a call from the ER uh, requesting an urgent uh, pericardiocentesis. Now, um, as we all know, uh, all interventional cardiologists absolutely love uh, doing pericardiocentesis. Uh, but for this particular case, um, you get a sudden feeling of extreme unease, a sense of uh, impending doom. Because way in the deep recesses of your mind, uh, re you remember this report uh, from uh, 2008. Uh, this was a small case series of patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension who underwent pericardiocentesis at a well-known hospital in Baltimore. All patients in this series died within 13 hours after pericardiocentesis. How can this be? How can evacuating pericardial fluid actually cause hemodynamic collapse in patients with severe uh, pulmonary hypertension? To try to understand this, let's go back and review some of the physiology. When you take a breath in, uh, the pressure inside your chest will fall. As a result, uh, more blood will flow into the chest and into the right heart. The venous return rises. The ventricle will fill with more blood and will get bigger. Um, as a result, the, uh, the right ventricle will distend in all directions, including pushing the septum into the left ventricle. The left ventricle then gets slightly smaller, uh, causing the cardiac output to fall and the blood pressure to drop. So when you take a breath in, your blood pressure will drop a little bit, uh, less than 10 millimeters of mercury. The opposite happens uh, when you exhale. This process is the so-called uh, interventricular dependence. Uh, bowing of the septum to the left and to the right uh, due to changes in venous return from breathing uh, causes changes in cardiac output and changes in the blood pressure. This is a normal physiologic process that happens with every breath. So what happens when you have a pericardial effusion? Well, the same thing actually, but it just gets amplified. So as before, when you take a breath in, the pressure inside your chest falls, uh, driving more blood into the right heart. The right heart still wants to distend, but because of the pericardial effusion, the right heart now ends up uh, distending more into the left heart. On echo, you'll see the septum bowing more into the left ventricle. This causes the left ventricle to get smaller than normal, resulting in a greater decrease in cardiac output and a greater fall in the blood pressure, generally more than 10 millimeters of mercury. This increase in the blood pressure drop with breathing is the so-called uh, pulses paradoxus. But as you now realize, there is no paradox at all. It's just an amplification of a normal physiologic process uh, caused by the presence of the pericardial effusion. As the size of the pericardial infusion increases, the pressure inside the pericardial space will rise and eventually match first the right heart filling pressure and then even the left heart filling pressure. This rising pressure in the pericardial space will first cause collapse of the right heart during diastole and eventually even during systole. Cardiac output then falls and hemodynamic collapse ensues. This is cardiac tamponade. So this is when we're called to do emergency pericardiocentesis. As you drain the fluid from the pericardium, you relieve the pericardial pressure. The right ventricle is able to fill again, and cardiac output goes back up. The effect is often quite striking, and patients on the brink of hemodynamic collapse can be brought back uh, within a matter of seconds. So if pericardiocentesis usually saves patients on the brink of hemodynamic collapse, how in the world can it actually precipitate hemodynamic collapse in patients with the pulmonary hypertension? The key to understanding this is right ventricular dysfunction. In pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle will initially hypertrophy but will eventually dilate. These patients very commonly have a significant uh, right ventricular dysfunction. 
So for patients with long-standing pulmonary hypertension, the right-sided pressures are usually already very high at baseline. So somewhat paradoxically, because the, right, the high right-sided pressures pushes back against the pericardial pressure from the effusion, patients with severe pulmonary hypertension can actually withstand more pericardial effusion than patients without pulmonary hypertension. Some have argued that pressure from the pericardial fluid to some extent actually helps keep RV dilation in check and help facilitate blood flow along into the high pressure uh, pulmonary artery. So what happens when you perform pericardial synthesis in these patients? Well, um, as you drain the fluid out, uh, you'll get a sudden loss in the pericardial pressure. The right heart will distend and you'll get a rapid rise in venous return. Now, normally this is fine because the RV would just increase this contractility to deal with the increased venous return. However, in pulmonary hypertension, that dysfunctional right ventricle is not able to accommodate the sudden increase in blood flow. It's not able to pump very well. So as a result, uh, with the rapidly increasing venous return, the right ventricle rapidly dilates, pushing that septum further out into the left ventricle. Cardiac output then falls rapidly and precipitating hemodynamic collapse. Now, a similar process can actually also happen to normal patients without pulmonary hypertension after large volume pericardial synthesis. That condition is known as the uh, pericardial decompression syndrome. So you're on call and this all sounds uh, pretty concerning. Uh, how common does this actually happen? Um, can pericardial synthesis actually be done safely uh, in patients with pulmonary hypertension? Well, uh, the short answer is yes. In a more recent report looking at pericardial synthesis in 170 patients, including 27 uh, with significant pulmonary hypertension, complications turned out to be quite rare. There were three major complications in this report, one who developed PEA but was successfully resuscitated, uh, one who had a uh, epicardial hematoma, and another who uh, needed a transfusion after evacuation of a bloody effusion. But all three of those patients actually turned out to be in the group without uh, pulmonary hypertension. There were no deaths in the study. So these authors concluded that pericardial synthesis can be safely done in patients with pulmonary hypertension and also suggested the use of invasive hemodynamic monitoring uh, during the procedure in these patients. So the use of Swan-Gans catheters uh, during pericardial synthesis uh, in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension has been proposed by others as well. The idea is to simultaneously measure the intrapericardial pressure as well as the right-sided filling pressures while you're doing the pericardial synthesis. You want to drain the pericardial space just enough, uh, just until the pericardial pressure is less than the uh, RA diastolic pressure and cardiac output rises and stop there. Uh, some pericardial fluid will be left behind. These authors did this successfully there for their patient in the case report, though in fairness, if you look at the tables, uh, the pulmonary pressures were not particularly high in their case. So uh, back to the patient. Um, as you're standing there uh, pontificating the merits of pericardial synthesis in patients with pulmonary hypertension with the ER physician, uh, your hand is forced. Uh, the patient uh, is getting worse. Uh, she is now clearly becoming more tachypnic and more tachycardic. Uh, she is looking significantly more uncomfortable. Her systolic blood pressure has fallen 20 points, and the echo now shows evidence of uh, right ventricular diastolic collapse. Uh, she now has echocardiographic and uh, clinical signs of tamponade. So you can't be around the bush anymore. It seems that the benefit of pericardial synthesis now outweigh uh, the risk. Uh, so you go ahead and take her uh, for pericardial synthesis. So we drained about 300 cc's of fluid and thankfully the procedure was uneventful. None of the dire things that we were imagining happened. Uh, there was a minimal effusion after the procedure. The patient felt better, her blood pressure improved, uh, a pericardial drain uh, was placed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the fluid did turn out to be malignant. Uh, the patient remained stable uh, during the rest of her hospitalization, and uh, she was discharged uh, with uh, oncology follow-up. All right, uh, take-home messages. Um, because of the uh, physiology of RV dysfunction, uh, pericardial synthesis in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension can be treacherous. Uh, you need to carefully weigh the risks and the benefits, uh, but it can be done safely. Uh, consider being less aggressive uh, in evacuating all of the fluid uh, and consider using a Swan-Gans catheter to help guide the procedure. Thank you for watching.